You and I talked before the meeting, uh, before we started tonight, we're going to introduce, introduce the new youth justice supervisor tonight, and she's prepared to do an overview of the program, but you indicated that maybe the board doesn't need to have an overview of the program, so yeah. I, I don't what was one of the board's wishes? Yeah, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, yeah. the reason why they're developing is we're all pretty much familiar with what is what it is. So, yeah, I imagine if the duties have changed a little bit. No, but. Um... It's it's up to the board. I, I she's prepared to give an overview. Now that you've heard it, Brian, have you so cool? The youth justice. No, right. no, I haven't heard that. Yeah, I think we'd like to. And then maybe, Mr. Chairman, we should do a roll call. See who we have. The minute takers, do you think? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, Chuck. Here. Uh, Jennifer McCormick, and Carol here, mm -hmm. Lorraine here, Tweed, yes, ma'am, Dale Olson, John Pettit, here, and Dr. Dunlap, here, and Dale Slater, here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for you know that. <laughs> Audience recognition, is there anybody here who is from not on the board and wants to make a statement about anything? Do we have approval on the agenda? Or we just need a... If there is nothing there, we'll be able to do that. Okay. 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 She's got it. Okay. Committee reports. Minutes. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, is everybody ready to this last month's meeting? We have a motion to approve. Motion to approve the minutes. Motion by Carol. Second. Second. Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. Aye. Now the committee I'll give an update. Um, I'm going to go through what was handed from our health clinic. We had LCO. LCO has seven positive COVID cases as of January 11, 2021. This is down from 19 positive cases on January 6, 21. All contact tracing is being done in a joint effort between Sawyer County Health and LCO Health Center COVID-19 team. The LCO Health Center has vaccinated 74 patients with both doses of Pfizer vaccine. These vaccines were given to the health care workers and tribal essential staff, including Sawyer County EMT. We have also vaccinated 50 patients with first doses of Moderna. We will have vaccinated 150 patients with first dose of Moderna by the 15th of January. Indian Health Service has provided us with what we will be getting. Well, Indian Health Services has provided us that we will be, has notified us that we will be getting 100 additional Moderna vaccines every other week. So that's how it's going to be distributed at this point. At this time, Pfizer vaccines are not available at IHS. Um, only gets 1,600 doses per week for the whole Bemidji area for Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. That's why we're only getting those lower amounts at this time. From CDC and Pfizer, only comes in cases of 975, so they cannot send out that many to one site. Um, the redistribution to other sites would be problem problematic, at, but will be worked out later on. The number of available vaccines expected to increase in March and should be available to everyone who wants the vaccine by the end of June. As it is believed, another vaccine may soon gain emergency use authorization. Our patient vaccinations and those who have had COVID-19 virus equate to a reduction in number of vulnerable community members. We, we expect to see a significant reduction in cases for these reasons. 
We expected a surge in the number of cases due to gatherings at Christmas and New Year's, but have not seen that surge yet. This may be in part due to the community members adhering to the CDC recommendations of wearing a mask, social distancing, hand washing, sanitizing, and avoiding gathering of 10 or more. We urge everyone to follow these guidelines, continue to slow the spread of the disease. We also have not seen any cases of flu, which at this time is unprecedented. This may also be a result of following CDC guidelines. And um, last time I mentioned that we are relocating our Oakwood Haven domestic abuse programming to open up more um, units for the homeless women and children. And we have added on to that men's um, homeless shelter. There, those beds are, have been implemented now and, and we continue to um, reach the capacity there. So we are trying to continue to address that need we have in the community. Um, we have opened up um, some of our quarantine homes now. We are utilizing those as those who are in need. Um, we are placing them into those homes and um, having them quarantined their isolation and taking care of them during that time. Um, I think we had, what, a total of 12 deaths. I'm sure Julia will, will bring that up too. Um, and I know we've lost a few tribal members, so we're trying to save as many of them as we can. Um, our daycare center will have its grand opening, I do believe, this Friday. And we should be operating, hopefully, in February, we'll open up our doors to our children and families. And um, beautiful facility. And our fire hall, um, we have that completed now. So we are working on um, implementing our department there and updating everything and giving the operation. So we'll be we'll making that move too. Um, with our aid from the state that came in to help tribes, we were able to help um, our members, who, household members, with their electric or gas or internet, depending on if they had children and needed school or whatever. Um, a thousand dollar amount for each household to help offset those costs, to help them continue to get through this pandemic mm -hmm. and to help those needs that we we're seeing. And we continue to pursue on how we can address the broadband, the Wi Fi, the internet. Um, for our reservation and for the needs of the people. Um, but we're still in the planning process there. We're still pursuing um, how we're going to get that done. But we're moving forward with that also. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's, it's hard in rural areas. Jeez. And um, I wanted to, I know the governor is working on things too. We've been working closely with the tribes on how we can continue to protect our people. And um, like I said, those joint efforts to save lives. So mm -hmm. all the way around the tribe, the county, the state, nationally. Um, what am I missing? What am I missing? Oh, um, we had a meeting with the Surrey County Sheriff's Department and Tribal PD regarding the drug use on the reservation. Yep. I want you to comment on that. Yep, and then so we are gonna be working jointly to address those issues that we're seeing in the community um, that um, we can move forward jointly to at all levels that needs to be done. Um, our treatment, we are looking into transitional housing. We are looking into possible detox center and then those measures so that we can continue to help those who are battling with those addictions and um, but also looking at ways of prosecuting those dealers out there so we can do what needs to be done at that angle also. So we'll be working jointly with the county and tribal and um, the tribe is working on some codes and ordinances also. And then the education um, just came from another meeting and um, both the tribal and public school, we're looking at other schools, how we're all using those safety measures and then more are coming into school, but the vaccination that we're doing, um, we start off with the healthcare providers, essential workers, and our educators fall into that. So we 
we felt, along with some other tribes in some of the states, um, within our education, we get our people vaccinated, just like our healthcare providers, so we can educate our children, keeping them as safe as we can. And then we're going in phases, so our elders and those who have health concerns, they are following in there and then continue with those essential workers, but we're gonna be working through those phases now and as quickly as we can. And of course, we can't make people, but more people are are coming to terms with things and are, are getting the vaccination now. And so as soon as we get them coming down to us, and I think something came to us that the president was gonna help distribute it quickly. Um, so it's not taking as long, but it's, it's taking us time to get them, you know, done now. And with our freezer that we're holding, we'll, we'll be able to hold house that vaccination, just in the Pfizer, that was not, that was used real quick, there's only so many, mm -hmm. but um, we want to help as many people as we can with what we have. Do you know how, um, what the acceptance rate for the vaccine is? Well, I think it's increasing. I can't give you an exact okay. figure, because like like everybody was kind of, you know, should we or shouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. But it's really increasing, it has been. And um, we wanted to see that because we are trying to protect our people. And we're, of course, you don't know. You know, we see things happening, but we'll save more by having them vaccinated than those who come into contact with them. So, that's, but I do, we do see the improvement. Right. It's just now we can get them quick enough. Yeah, right. And you have to have both doses. You have to get both of them or it will not work. So, Excellent. Good. Dr. Dunlap, it's Julia. I think I'm going to speak a little bit. We are, I'm just starting to collect the data on the acceptance rates, and it really seems like it's increasing. The wait list um, for LCO seems to be fairly high compared to maybe our, our regular population out within the rest of the county. So I think the acceptance rate is growing now that they've seen more and more vaccine be distributed without, throughout LCO. Yeah, I'm here, Dale. All right. I'll just make it really brief. I just want to um, bring a couple things um, forward. One on a positive note, in 2020, we received over $50,000 in donations for the Senior Resource Center countywide. The majority of it went to um, Meals on Wheels, of course, and then as another amount, the next larger amount, went towards um, fundraising for our new bus that we'd like to purchase in 2021. From January to mid-March, we served 5000 5,045 meals. And then from mid-March until um, the end of December, we served 33,177 meals with a total of 38,222 meals. With the majority of those meals being home delivered, which was 20,841. Our carry out or pickup at all our sites were 10,330. And then frozen meals go out to people if we have to close or we have individuals who are not able to ha to prepare meals on weekends, so they also get frozen meals. And that was another 2,006 meals that went out. So when you look at the cost to um, serving those meals, it's about $8.50 um, per meal to prepare those meals. So for that number of meals, it's a cost to us or to our providers, our grantees, and everyone, and everyone else. $324,887 to provide those 38,222 meals in 2020 um, in Sawyer County. Those, um, we have a few more numbers that we're putting together. It might change a little bit, but um, it will be about that. Um, our sites take in anywhere from a dollar and 65 cents um, donation per meal all the way up to four dollars and ninety cents per meal so we have you know there's a fluctuation in there so there's um definitely if you look at just the five dollar donation if everyone paid the five dollar donation 
it would be $191,110 that we would collect. So there still is a big difference between that. So that's why the donations and the grants we write this year have been so positive. Um, and that $50,000 in donations does not include the $47,000 that I got in grants this year from the National Meals on Wheels program. And we're already starting out um, in 2021 with probably at least three or 4,000 donations that have already come in for the Meals on Wheels program for 2021. So there are some really, Despite COVID and everything else, there's been some positive things that have happened at the Senior Center this year. Um, the other thing that if you haven't already heard, um, the Senior Center in Exxon is temporarily closed. Um, the site manager on December 31st when she left until she returned on January 4th, left the oven on. Um, the assumption is right now that there was a possible issue with a stove, that there was some soot and stuff that built up in that stove. And because it was left on for so long, um, when she got to work on January 4th, the building was filled with smoke. So unfortunately, we had to close the site. We're working with the insurance companies, the adjusters, trying to figure out what was wrong with the stove. Um, everything, all of the equipment has been inspected. Everybody that needs to have gone in to look at things has been there. We are now temporarily um, cooking meals out of the United Methodist Church in Excellent. Mark Bartlett has been gracious enough to let us use his kitchen until we have everything figured out. The building is actually owned by Sawyer County Housing Authority. They are working through their insurance company. We're working through our insurance company and all the adjusters. So I'm hoping um, fairly soon by the first part of February that we'll be able to open back up. The one thing that has to be done, um, the stove will have to be moved out of the site, um, will have to be moved into the parking lot and steam cleaned. If anybody knows of somebody in the area that can do something like that, please send them my way. That's about what I have. Any questions? So you get enough funding, Joey, for the whole year then? Yeah, we actually did We actually did really well. The one thing that um, happens when we get all of these donations, so for example, when we get like $2,000 of donations for the Meals on Wheels program, we have to spend that money down before we can um, send a claim into GUAR for the money that they provide for us each year. So we actually are sitting fairly well with what we have left from GUAR for this year. Um, I can honestly say that we are going into 21 being very financially, I won't say perfectly secure, but we're going into 2021 20, with no debt. So all of our past debt is paid off. So we're actually um, doing quite well. Um, the community as a whole has been very generous to us in 2020. So no, we are where we were two and a half, three years ago um, is a long ways away from where we are now. We're we're doing very well over here. It was a it was a lot of work, um, but we did it. I have a great team over here, a lot of good employees at our sites and stuff like that. And if it wasn't for the team I have here at the senior center and the team that I have out at all the sites, we wouldn't be where we are today. So a big thank you goes to them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have adult long-term care. Okay, we have a resolution for the um, <clears throat> Age and Disability Resource Center, and I'm gonna have Lori Perlick, our adult long-term care supervisor, and also the ADRC of the North Haver Branch Manager, introduce it to you and give a little bit of background on why the resolution the board tonight. Okay. Good evening. So over the last 22 years, as the ADRCs developed across the state of Wisconsin, funding was rolled out in three different waves. Um, the funding to each ADRC was dependent upon the year in which the ADRCs began operating. In our case, we are part of the Aging and Disability Resource Center of the North here in Sawyer County, along with Ashland County, Bayfield County, Iron County, 
and Price counties. In 2017, the Office of Resource Center Development started an effort to develop new allocation methodology for the existing ADRC funding. Um, they created a stakeholder group that consisted of the Office of Resource Center Development and their aging partners, the Aging and Disability Professional Association of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Counties Human Services Association, the Wisconsin Human Services Fiscal Management and Tribal Partners. Um, by 2019, they had determined that any reallocation methodology that they came up with using existing funding would not be met favorably at the county levels. Um, any reallocation was gonna create winners and losers among the counties. So in 2019, ORCID and that advisory group expanded the purpose of the group to move from a reallocation model to a reinvestment model. What they used for that reinvestment was they started by determining the amount that was necessary to fully fund each ADRC. They employed the long path thinking to support population growth and service evolution and to address health equities in the distribution and allocation. The result of that work group is before you now in the form of the resolution. Um, if you look at the section that says, now therefore be it resolved, you'll see what the ask is from this stakeholders group, that $27.4 million. If anyone is interested in the full methodology that was used, there is a PowerPoint that I can distribute to you that was shared with the Aging and, Dis Aging and Disability Resource Center managers and directors that goes into the nuts and bolts of how they came up with each one of those funds that they're asking for. Any questions for Lori? Well, Please. No, but I, I would make a motion that we approve and accept this resolution supporting increased funding for aging and disability resource centers. I recommend that we pass it on to the full county board for approval. Motion. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Okay, we have the motion and second. Lori, I have a just a quick question. Was any of that formula that was created to decide the new numbers, was that kind of based on or sort of based on the original maintenance of effort from the counties? Or did that not even come into play? In the, in the initial round, you know, between 27 and 2017 and 2019, they did look at some of those parameters, um, but again, then that went out the window when they decided that they needed to look at making every ADRC whole as opposed to trying to take away from some ADRCs so that other ADRCs would have more funding. Because okay, that's what would happen with a reallocation model. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Anybody online? Okay, if not, everybody in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed, same time. Motion is passed. Thank you. Don, do we need to pass this? Do you want to get a sign? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll do that then. I remember the science. Wisconsin Home Energy Assistance Program. I have an update for our WEAP program, the energy program, and um, 
wanted to share this with you because Barb Weber, who oversees the program, was pretty excited at the end of last year that they had an administration review and it went very well. And I didn't realize until afterwards that she was a bit nervous about it. And it went really well. And um, by the way, energy assistance covers well, energy assistance that helps with furnish repairs and weatherization. Um, she did send me some notes to share with you. I'm not going to go through all of them. I want to highlight a couple of them. Oh, by the way, Kim Christensen, um, who is also an economic support services specialist, is a backup to, to a bar on the energy assistance program. So she noted that unlike previous years, many people went into the season with, um, with adequate, for the most part, adequate propane or takes due, due to the low, low cost. And, she, and as we all know, the weather's been very cooperative this year, so there hasn't been a real strain asking for assistance. Um, it's interesting, she said she's had no propane crisis situations at all. She's on call, and, and um, Kim is her backup, so they get calls after hours if there's, if there's problems not having energy and the furnace gets out, and then they have to address that. Um, and then she also noted that um, at this time, the, uh, the business is about the uh, business is down, down about five percent over the last uh, few over the last few years, and that's consistent with other counties. And I'm assuming that's because we've had the real real mild weather. Um, she said, furnace repairs and replacements are about the same as last season, but there's longer wait times now to get stuff fixed and repaired because of getting the parts. Um, and she also wanted me to note that the uh, program year runs from October. October 1st to October 1st, and then September of each year. And that most of what she processes is, is uh, done between October and December. So 65 to 70% of the applications are processed and 50% of the furnace activity occurs during that time period. That's the update, any questions? How much was that? Which part, the- uh, the, the amount that they have for the program? She said most, Generally speaking, we process 65 to 70 percent of our applications um, from October 1st to the end of December, and then 50 percent of the furnace activity occurs during that time as well. But I mean, like, what is the amount for the? Did they didn't say. I didn't say the amount. I can okay. get that to you. I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Is that separate from the tribes? Right. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, but it helps. Tell you. And Paul, how do how do people apply for this? There's a whole pamphlet I can send this oh. to you. There's just all, all kinds of criteria. Okay. Um, and if you, go, if you go to the website, just just Google um, we are all that information there. But these brochures are available to the public. Tell us how they can apply, who's who's qualified, and all mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Justice. Okay, I'd like to introduce our new uh, supervisor, uh, Youth Justice Supervisor, Brittany Haig. She takes the place of, of Dave Bauer, who recently retired. Um, and she's prepared to give you a little bit of program overview. But before we do that, I just want to give you a little bit of a background. And, and Brittany, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so if I mess anything up, you can add to it. I can tell you, within Health and Human Services, she's held three positions so far. She did start out as a CCS service facilitator. She transitioned into a youth justice social worker and now assumed the youth justice supervisor position. She has um, she's a pretty good leadership program, uh, I mean, a background uh, with law enforcement in the military. Uh, she's also done some work at Oasis, a group home, and also with the Sorry County Dispatch. So with that, I introduce Brittany Hay. Brittany Hay. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I wanted to kind of do a little bit of a program overview. Um, I don't know how long it's been since maybe Dave's attended a meeting and done this. So I have a PowerPoint that I'll share. And then at the end, if anybody has any questions, then I can um, go over that. So give me one second here. Is that PowerPoint coming up, Alex? Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, so just kind of going over what we do. So we operate under Wisconsin state statute to provide services to youth in our community. Um, we receive criminal referrals as well as juvenile in need of protection or services under chapter 938. 
Um, so under that, we provide intake, disposition, and ongoing services and court services. So really that will look like um, juvenile supervision, uh, which is kind of the equivalent of probation. Uh, we also do truancy under Chapter 118. That's been, um, we've always done that, but more recently we've done more of that. So we work with the schools, truancy court, we work with the school resource officers and families to increase school attendance. Um, and more recently, we try to help determine mitigating factors affecting truancy instead of just, are you going to school or are you not going to school? We're looking more at the environmental factors that are affecting truancy. Um, we work with out-of-home placements. Um, we place out-of-home and then we provide ongoing supervision while they're in out-of-home placements. Um, uh, my position acts as a liaison between Sawyer County and Northwest Oasis Group Home. And um, also after hours, on-call services uh, for CPS and Youth Justice. Um, so our referrals come from law enforcement primarily uh, for our delinquency and then as well as our truancy that comes from the school resource officer, which is law enforcement. Uh, we get referrals from truancy court. Uh, our truancy court will have the simple truancy um, and then we may get um, truancy referrals that require like further investigation um, where we go out and to the home and we will um, visit the home, visit the family, see you know some of those environmental factors um, or we will also from the school get the habitual truancy referrals under chapter 938. And we also get referrals from service providers and families um, for more informal consultations, meeting with families um, regarding voluntary services. And those are kind of some um, of the more proactive meetings we try to do to try to mitigate um, some delinquent behaviors down the road. Um, so our focus is um, more on the restorative justice. So. Um, when we get a kid that who comes into our care, we look at the restorative justice. So we're looking at competency development, accountability, and community safety, um, and how all of those things can be addre addressed. Um, we ensure juveniles are held accountable, that the community is safe, and that the community is safe, and that there's competency development to overcome deficits that the juveniles face, and assist in keeping them out of the adult criminal justice system. Um, so when we're addressing this, sometimes we are getting from the community or from the victim that you know we want a kid held accountable, we want them to be punished, but punishment really isn't what we do. It's that accountability piece to ensure that they're not gonna be in the system, um, they're not reoffending, and that they're not going to be in the adult <laughs> system. Um, so we're kind of looking at what's new in youth justice. So we have the staff turnover, Dave retired obviously, um, and Deidre, who is the other worker in our units, looking at retiring in the next few months. So that'll be another big turnover for us. Um, also, what's new is our involvement in truancy court. Um, we've always been minimally involved, but that uh, has been increasing um, due to COVID and just kind of in how our departments uh, reformed in the last probably year. So we have been attending truancy court to see what's coming through in simple truancy. Um, and because of the way that Commissioner Schlender has kind of reformed how he's doing truancy court, we're getting more of the tiered approach referrals. So if um, they're called tier three referrals, if we determine that there's some environmental factors in the home that the school's recommending that, you know, there's, there's something kind of going on um, in this household that we feel like could be dangerous to the child um, that doesn't maybe quite meet like a CPS referral, then, um, under chapter 938, we have uh, jurisdiction to go into the home and help with that. So we've been involved that way in truancy court, which has been really helpful. Um, under the state, what's new um, is this youth assessment and screening instrument, um, YAZI. So that is um, an assessment tool we're using to assess how often or if uh, youth will reoffend. Um, it uses their strengths and needs to assess our case planning. Um, so Surrey County is not on this program yet um, and we're scheduled either second or third quarter in 2021 to be on this. 
um, which is going to affect kind of timelines um, and case planning for us. And we're also going through training right now for Unity, which is a software platform um, for the interstate compact for juveniles. Um, and basically what that is, is it's, it's a data system for tracking interstate movement. So if we have a, a child in supervision here and they're moving to a different state, um, it's just like kind of a, a nationwide tracking system, which will make um, information sharing a lot easier. And um, we're also working um, in getting some of our youth on the state youth leadership team. So if we have um, juveniles who are um, in the youth justice system, um, the youth leadership teams are, they meet quarterly and they um, try to get involved in the youth justice reform at a state level and it gives them kind of a voice um, to try to make change. So we're, we're working on that too because we don't have anybody involved in that currently. Um, and then, you know, just the COVID challenges. Uh, we spent the first few months of 2020 or I guess March through June um, not having any face-to-face -face contact with clients and now we're kind of taking it in a tiered approach. Um, our more high-risk clients we're seeing face-to-face some we try to see by Zoom, some by phone, just kind of based on their, their risk level um, for reoffending or what their behaviors look like. So that's always a challenge because it's really hard to determine, you know, where a kid's at. So we're, we're trying our best with that. Um, but we, the school's been really accommodating with us and utilizing other service providers that always see kids face to face and getting information from them. Um, and try to utilize the family as much as we can to get gather information on them. So um, we're, we're adapting to those challenges, but it's, it's worked out pretty well for us so far. Our current trends that we're seeing um, are a significant increase in truancy. We had our first um, truancy hearing on in November and we had 65 cases um, just from the time school started until November. So those weren't rollover cases from last school year. That was just from the time school started. Um, our next court date is tomorrow and we'll have 50 new cases. So those are simple truancy kids who have missed five days. Um, and I know the school's been pretty lenient, not lenient, but they've had to kind of accommodate their, their truancy policy based on um, just, you know, kids who are attending virtually, kids who are attending in person, kids who are out with COVID. So they've had to kind of adjust their, their attendance policy. So even with the adjusted attendance policy, we're still at over 100 truancy cases, um, you know, by January. And those are the simple truancy cases. We've also had 46 habitual truancy cases um, since August 1st. So, and those are kids who've missed multiple times and um, have had multiple citations. So um, we've had a, a pretty significant increase in our truancy this year. Um, we've had an increase in behavioral mental health, behavioral and mental health concerns from families. Um, so we're, you know, making a lot of referrals out to clinics, um, utilizing the mental health navigator at the high school or in the school district, trying to make sure that our kids are getting, you know, adequate um, health counseling and um, an increase also in the juvenile runaways. Um, I think time cooped up with families and it's, you know, exacerbating some of the family struggles that they already have and families that have not maybe enforced certain rules that are trying to enforce rules now um, has led to a significant increase in the juvenile runaways that we're seeing. Um, but we're also seeing a decrease in criminal referrals due to lockdowns and school closures because a lot of that, you know, is resulting in kids not being out in the community as much. Um, the referrals that we typically get from the schools and they were locked down um, last spring and then early in part of fall. So it's shifted a little bit from where we were this time last year. Um, and then this is just a list of local resources for youth. I'm sorry, I see a hand raised. Is there a question? I can wait until the end. Thank you. Oh, sure. 
Um, and this is just a list of local resources for youth. Um, we do a lot, or we've been trying to do more referrals of the CCS program and working with that, um, the LCO CCS program, um, utilizing the day treatment program, um, the outpatient mental health and AODA counseling, um, referring out to Northwest Connection Family Resources, ICAA, and then working with Sarah Walport um, to try to utilize the counseling through school. And that's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Welcome again. Yeah, thank you. Does yeah. anybody have any questions? Yeah, do you have one? Yeah, I'll give one and then I'll ask. Yeah, let's. Okay, Dale Wilson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, uh, Brittany, thank you for your report. It was excellent. I personally, um, you know, I'm, I'm, have been in the system of government for many, many years, and I understand that we use acronyms for everything. And, but one thing I would like, I guess, personally, is mm -hmm. when we use nebulous words like significant and increase and decrease, you know, if we can have kind of some hard and fast numbers, you know, a 2% increase is far less than a 50% increase. Sure. And I don't think giving away those numbers has anything to do with any kind of confidentiality. That okay. would be great for me. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, Brittany, um, you, are you working with a lot of Native youth? Yes, we do. And you tie in, and I know you mentioned CCS as the program we have through our behavior health, um, because you mentioned offering those services and the support that's needed for them so we can catch them at a young age and help them get healthy or whatever it is, because we are trying to address the adults too and the family component as a whole, but with these addictions we're seeing, we're trying to intervene and prevent as much as we can. And um, I know your role covers a lot of areas. It does. I, I work closely with Dave. Dave and him for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm glad to see you come aboard now because I didn't know who was going to take his place. And I did not know um, oh, my name. I'm terrible with names. Is it Tyree now? Deidre. Deidre. I would have served many years too. Who was going to take her place? Do you have anybody yet? Or are you seeking that somebody out for that? We don't have anybody yet. Um, Paul and I have kind of been discussing, you know, what, what the plans are. Um, and I think she'll be on board for a little while yet, but she's, you know, discussing what her retirement plans are. So we're just kind of in the process of, of discussing what, what that'll look like. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a big loss to have, you know, people, individuals who've been here for so many years. Um, it's a lot of experience. Yeah, but they're so needed, though, for the younger people. Right, um, right. The whole program is so much needed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Ms. Haig, this is Supervisor Pettit. I'd like to find out what the entity is available down to the southern end of the, the county with the winter and... Uh, specifically the winter school district i see that the counselor for the hayward school is on there miss sarah yet yeah, sarah what was it wall mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and most of those uh the northwest connections and all of that is what up towards the northern end of the district of the county what is yeah. down for the southern end which is loretta draper winter you're looking at radisson Possibly Couturier. Yes. A little bit of one. Um, Northwest Connections does service the entire county and they do travel into homes in all parts of the county. So they like they have um, I can't think of the name of the program right off the top of my head. It's a 16 to 22 week program where they go um, community response program and they go right into the home. So when I have um, juveniles that are struggling and a lot of times it's, you know, with boundaries with parents and that type of thing, they'll go right into the home and they travel all over the county and go right into the home. And that's been a really successful program. Are you working with uh, within the school uh, with the counselor, the guidance counselor at all? Yes, I do that as well. 
Um, and I haven't, I don't have any um, kiddos down in winter right now, but typically we do, um, I do work right in the school with the guidance counselors as well. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yes, that was. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to share my screen now. Oops. That's not what you need to see. Let's get you on what you want to look at here tonight. A few things going on. Okay. So, uh, January 12th. Can't believe we're into 2021. You've been seeing an awful lot of public health, not your normal expectation, or not, not to be expected for normal uh, years. Um, so far, cumulative cases that we've had for positives are 12 98, 1,298. We have 63 active right now. We have 17 deaths. And anybody that's been following our data on our death um, tolls that we've had related to COVID might notice that there's been a jump in the recent uh, like two weeks. And that is because we've been really working hard to um, track down death certificates. We do not report a death until we have a valid death certificate for that. So um, despite the fact that somebody might say that this person died from COVID, we do um, follow the guidance from Wisconsin and do all our tracking. We are still um, have a, a couple deaths that we're waiting for to find out where, um, what, where that's going to lie with death certificates. And just to let you know, it's typically after somebody dies, it's at least two weeks before we report out and possibly even a couple of months. So these numbers can feel a little kind of off. So I just wanted to kind of put that caveat in there. Um, and then the other information that I do have on that is everybody who has died in our county has been over the age of 60. And um, next month when I report out, I'll be able to give some uh, breakdown in what we're seeing with the deaths. But one of the things why I'm talking about that, not only is our number jumped up, but also when we start looking at what areas they're focusing on vaccinating and looking at that in the future, it definitely is related to people who are older than 65, 70, years of age because that is definitely the people that are most susceptible um, to having severe effects of having COVID. The other data I have on this slide is um, 28 probables and probables can be kind of confusing. These are people who have been tested with what we call antigen testing. This is a, a test that um, focuses on protein and these are very, very, um, scientific uh, data here, so it might be a little confusing. What we actually use is what's called PCR testing, and that testing um, actually focuses more on DNA, so it's more reliable testing, and those are the ones that we truly put into positive. When we put them into probable, it's because we're doing testing that's based on protein, so it's based on a derivative of the DNA. Or it may be somebody who is just living in a home with somebody who is a positive case and they get sick with the same symptoms, we put them into the probable area. We hadn't seen this as much in our community, but we are seeing it more now. Um, and we've had 7,360 people who have tested negative. Uh, we are still at a red risk level for our county. Um, we have uh, right now 38 cases per 100,000. The state itself is at about 58 per cases per 100,000. And if I can find my notes, last month on the 15th, we were at 78 cases per 100,000. So that is quite a jump from kind of our pre going into Christmas, or not jump, drop. Uh, pre going into Christmas. So 
Um, right now, our average cases is 6.3. We were seeing um, well over 30 cases per day for a while there. So everybody's focus right now now is on vaccine distribution. We are still doing testing. Um, testing sites are available. We have even more community testing available at LCO. We still have our National Guard sites for testing on Wednesdays in uh, winter at the fire hall. And we are still having our lines open for curbside testing at LCO and at um, the hospital. So all of those testing sites are still available, but we definitely have seen a drop in testing. Um, focus for our energies in the health department have, um, we're, we're kind of continuing our contact tracing, we're continuing everything we're doing, um, but we are moving into vaccine distribution. So um, what I have here on this slide is um, our vaccine sites. And when I say sites, they are not open sites to be able to go out and just receive vaccine. But they are sites that have received vaccine and have been working on what um, we are calling tiers of vaccination. So right now we're vaccinating tier 1A, which are healthcare workers and long-term care workers. Um, and so from an LCO perspective, they were the first ones to get vaccine and um, we're able to distribute that, I think a week before the hospital received theirs. And um, so the hospital received vaccine just before Christmas. Uh, Ascentia and Hayward received the vaccine last week. North Lakes received vaccine last, last week. Um, Hayward Health Services, one of our nursing homes, had uh, CVS come in and vaccinate their staff and residents on sun this past Sunday, uh, the 10th, and Waters Edge had um, their residents, they had already done their staff, their residents were vaccinated today. So, so far to date, we have um, our first, people who have received their first dose of vaccines administered um, as of last Friday was over 500. So we don't have quite the, the, the exact numbers um, we, because we are actually receiving, we're getting more vaccine out of vials than what we had anticipated. And we know that's going to fluctuate, um, but it's a little over 500 doses that we have been able to get out into Sawyer County, which is very exciting. Um, vaccine plans. So this is where we've been spending a lot of time, a lot of calls on with everybody. Um, North Lakes still needs to continue to get the rest of their staff vaccinated in Hayward. Um, so they'll be receiving back, they've received vaccine this week and we'll be doing that. Um, the health department now has finally gotten on and been approved to receive vaccine. So we have vaccine as well. And so we will be, we will be focused on the rest of 1A. So these are really unaffiliated healthcare workers and assisted living. And what I do want to kind of comment, kind of step back and comment on is last week was a huge week for everybody. Um, the hospital uh, did not have they, 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 they ordered more vaccine than they needed for their own staff so that we could work on our unaffiliated health care. So these are, you know, dentists, hospice, um, home health, um, uh, kind of all of that kind of people that, that have small businesses um, where they, they would not order in vaccine themselves. But um, the health department wasn't approved to receive vaccine yet, and the hospital was. So we worked very closely with the hospital. They finished off the rest of their staff. And then um, we were able to fill slots with them to get unaffiliated healthcare workers in our community. The other thing that ended up happening was we worked closely with Essentia. Um, and Essentia ended up getting more vaccine than, that, than they needed to distribute. So we worked with them to also fill slots for unaffiliated healthcare workers. So it's, it, it was kind of a whirlwind last week and prepping for this week. So this week we have um, 100 doses that we will be getting out to unaffiliated healthcare workers. 
um, and volunteers with um, the hospital and with hospice and clergy to make sure that we have people that are able to go in safely um, to long-term care in the hospitals. The other thing that was just released yesterday is that law enforcement and fire will be able to receive vaccine on the uh, 18th, which is next Monday. Um, so we've placed our orders for vaccine um, to go into next week. And, and I'm gonna just step back. I know I'm talking a lot more than what's on my slide, but I just wanna let you know that when we, or we do not know what we're getting from week to week from vaccine. And so we place an order and we find out sometime between, so we place an order on Tuesday. So I placed my order today and I'm gonna find out sometime between Friday and Sunday night what I got from my order. And then I have to be able to distribute that the next week. And so um, there's a lot of pre-planning going in, a lot of trying to get appointments set um, not wanting to set appointments that we don't know that we're going to have vaccine for. So we're kind of playing um, that game as we move forward. The other thing that um, we are doing right now is we really do believe that K through 12 faculty, staff, um, everybody in that realm, bus drivers, food service, will actually be in the next um, rollout of uh, essential workers and so we're working with them to identify all those staff and then i'm also been i'm on calls with the clinics um and the hospital every week and including lco when i say clinics i mean lco as well and um and we're prepping everybody to be ready for 75 and older um, that's what the federal government has approved on when we go into the next phase and our thoughts are that um, they will focus on their patients that are 70 and 5 and older. Um, the, the health department will kind of be the, per, the, the place that kind of gets everybody that kind of falls through the cracks there. But we'll also be focused on the essential businesses like law enforcement, fire, schools, um, potentially um, those that are um, involved in food service or um, grocery stores, that type of thing. So what, the other thing that we're doing is we're following SDMAC, and this stands for, I know this is an acronym, but it was very long to put on a slide. So it stands for the State Disaster Medical Advisory Committee. And they are the ones who, like the CDC, kind of does the federal guidance for who gets the vaccine next. Our SDMAC for our state makes those decisions. And so we have to wait for them. Um, when, we, when we say we want vaccine, we have to say that we're going to vaccinate within their guidelines. So that's what we're watching for right now. I'm expecting public comments to come out so that we know who's on the next phases as we move forward. The other thing we just heard today is that uh, um, there are federal plans to release like a bolus, meaning that means like a whole bunch of vaccine they're gonna release out to the states. So um, what happens is the states every week apply for vaccine and they don't know what they're gonna get. And then they, whatever they get, then they have to pull, dole out to us. We believe that um, the feds are thinking of actually distributing a lot of vaccine. Um, and when we, when we talk through that, what does that really mean and how they're going to distribute it? Um, this goes back to something that Lorraine was talking about. They have the ultra cold freezer at LCO. Um, so um, Dr. Steve and I are on calls with one another trying to figure out, they get their vaccine through IHS, Indian Health Services. We get ours through the state. Um, is there a way that we could actually merge together, get a big chunk of vaccine distributed to LCO to keep it their ultra cold freezer and we can work together. So these are things that have never been worked on before um, with this type of mass vaccination, but we are working very closely to make sure that we're in good position for Sawyer County. And then the other thing is, is we know people want to start volunteering. So if there are people that are out here listening onto the call, um, I know you want to start volunteering. We are in the we are in the depths of really trying to plan our vaccine clinics for this week, make sure that we are 
distributing our vaccine as safely as we can. So we are working with our, our intact staff that we have right now, but we will be reaching out to other members of the community to help us as we move forward because there will be a lot of vaccines that need to be distributed in the future. So I gave you an awful lot and I did not hardly take a breath. So <laughs> I'm sure I have people that have questions. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Hi, Julia, this is Tweed. Yes. Um, yeah, as Lorraine mentioned, and you know, we have that expensive freezer that can hold mm -hmm. the Pfizer product. Um, and I think the reason we heard we weren't getting the vaccine is because it would have to come in such a large bulk of vaccine. Yes. We need to work together, what you're saying, um, so that we can receive that vaccine and share it with many people and be able to give it within that time frame. Yes. That's kind of been a hold up for us also. And so right now, Dr. Steve and I actually did talk about that and I'll just kind of give a little messaging. IHS has um, more open guidance on being able to distribute that vaccine than it would be if it came through the state directly. Uh, my, my guidance right now is to stick with IHS because if you were receiving it from the state, we cannot be expanding. We're, we are very lucky um, that LCO is receiving vaccine through IHS because they have been vaccinating even more members of our community than we would have been able to do. And that is really protecting a very vulnerable population. So, but when we see that kind of that fine line where it's gonna open up, um, we'll definitely work together. And I'm very happy to, to put a whole bunch of ultra cold storage and move it over to LCO and, and just make trips over there to get our vaccine. Okay, great. Mr. Chairman, is that you? No, maybe not. Who, who else has their hand up? Other Dale. Dale oh, Olson. I'm sorry. Dale Olson, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Thank you. Um, what percentage of people do you think are going to actually want to get the vaccine? You know, we are, uh, I'm hoping by next month I have a little better numbers for you. I've, I've actually reached out to all of the healthcare facilities to figure out what percentage of their staff are receiving vaccine or choosing to receive vaccine right now. Um, I'm going to just give you a ballpark. Uh, because I've not been able to put numbers together. I'm thinking it's between 60% uh, and 80% are choosing to get vaccinated. Would you like other opinions? <laughs> well, I'm just going by exactly what they have. So they have their staff. I'm, and, and Are you asking me about population or are you asking me about what, what people are actually choosing? Oh, the population. General population, not okay. not of medical professionals, of course. And and, and you'd be surprised that some medical pro professionals might might not want it as much as the the public. But I would yes, if you want to share that right now, or if you want to share offline, that's fine. Thank you. Offline? Are you saying offline? I did not say that. <laughs> oh, do you want to share? Oh, are you going to share with what your thoughts are? I, I I don't see you know in the in the people that I run into in my uh, workaday life, um, I'm I'm hearing far less than half. Okay. And and, and that's you know amongst uh, construction workers and rednecks, and I I don't know if they represent the mainstay of our society, but I think they're a significant portion. So. Uh -huh. You know, we, I, I'm guessing somewhere around 50%. Mm -hmm. And, and I, actually, I'm, I would not be surprised with that. I'm just looking at what, and actually the other thing, um, just to kind of go a little bit further with this, there was a very, it was a very small amount that wanted the first doses until they actually started seeing what was happening with people receiving doses. And then that number has become, has risen. And so I expect it to be a lower amount that initially wanted, and then um, that will potentially rise. And, and, and frankly, we're just going to order for the demand. And, and my job is just to get it into arms of people who want it right now. Not to, not to go, you know, not to like go rapping on everybody's doors, but I wanna make sure that everybody who wants a vaccination gets a vaccination. 
You've had the absolute worst first year of employment than anybody could possibly <laughs> for. Thank you. I so wanna, thank you, Miss. I came up here to really enjoy the outdoors. I am doing the best I can, but yes. <laughs> I have a question. I'm just curious, Julie, that 7360 data point, negative data point, is that duplicated or unduplicated? Seventy three sixty negative data point, the negative results from the test. Oh are those, uh, are those duplicated or unduplicated? I, I am so sorry. I wasn't following you. Um yes, so those are duplicated. So if somebody receives a negative result five times, they still count as one. Okay. Um, one of the other numbers, actually, thank you for asking this question. One of the things that we're hoping to be able to do, and I'm trying to juggle this between this vaccine distribution and trying to get the end of the year results, but I would like to get like the total number of tests that were done in 2020, um, mm -hmm. just so that we can kind of see that and just get the, the amount of work because it wasn't, it wasn't the health department that did this testing. This was our Healthcare facilities uh, that were that and National Guard that were out there doing the testing and making things happen. So we do want to make sure that we get that out there along with all of the PPE distribution and everything else that's happened this year. We have one more. So that clinic's not going on tomorrow. The clinic I here. Have, we have a clinic here. We have a clinic. Tomorrow? We have a hundred people slated to get vaccinated this week. Okay. They're all by appointment only. I'm just going to say this. We are doing this by appointment only. We're working with the uh, um, businesses that meet 1A criteria to be able to get their uh, staff vaccinated. When are the social workers and the direct staff at Human Services able to get that? I talked to Lauren this morning. I thought that was going to start happening tomorrow. We are on. Um, we are on a. We have people slated to come in. We know we're going to have gaps, and we also know that we'll probably have more vaccine. Um, one of the things is um, we have Pfizer, and we have been told that we should be able to get extra doses out of there. And the best way to do that is to work with staff that are in house who are eligible. So we're going to work on trying to get them in. So we're juggling as fast as we can to get everybody. Um, we'll know tomorrow how many extra doses we have. Okay, thanks. Okay, mm -hmm. Scott, do you have your hand up? I do. I have Hello. two quick questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, since we're on this vac vaccine vaccine uh, topic, let's go with the first question. Um, someone gets both doses, they can still be a carrier? So, yeah, that's a very good question. We do not know. Um, so at this point, uh, the recommendations until there is more research that is done. So what they, what they don't know is, are you truly not getting it at all? Or are you, tr are you just becoming asymptomatic and you can carry it? And that is why they are continuing to have us wear masks and social distance until they understand that more. That is definitely something, though, that is heavy in the research right now. Okay. And the uh, second question was with the amount of deaths that are reported that are COVID related and being that most of them are, I think you reported all of them over 60, are, are they ever going to break that down then and then give a determination of, you know, what was the underlying thing that I, I don't think to date nobody has actually expired just from COVID, correct? I mean, there has to be something um, I would have to truly go in and see. There might be, I, I, I'm not going to, there might, I, I have not looked at every single case, so I do not want to say that there isn't somebody that just didn't really have much going on and all of a sudden had respiratory failure due to COVID. So I would not feel comfortable saying that. Um, but I can say that I do know that a majority of people have been elderly, which puts them at greater risk. And typically you have other comorbidities along with that. Um, with that said, um, that's why they're at higher risk, and that's why we want to make sure we get them vaccinated the soonest. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Julia, yes. I remember 
either last month or the month before, when you were reporting about COVID-19 deaths, you used the phrase, and one of those people had no underlying medical issues. So I, I think there was at least one. Okay. And I'm sorry, I have so much data no, 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 swarming no, no, no. in my head that okay. I do not recall. <laughs> probably retain 90% more than I will. So, yeah, know. Julia, you mentioned um, one of the nursing homes. And yes. you also mentioned that you vaccinated the patients and the staff. But we were getting messages that there was an outbreak in one of the nursing homes. And um, I'm not sure how accurate that is but that they had to isolate some of those patients on a certain wing in a certain area because of how many who had contacted that disease. Is that accurate or can you say or not? We, we have had outbreaks. Actually, we've had outbreaks in all of the nursing homes and assisted livings. Um, and so the vaccine, unfortunately, has not come fast enough um, to some of the long-term care facilities. Um, that is where some of our deaths have occurred. Uh, due to the outbreaks. And if you think about um, the people that tend to have to live in an assisted living or a nursing home, there's a lot of people with dementia and Alzheimer's and trying to redirect them and make sure they wear masks and isolate is a difficult thing to do. So that is one of the reasons why we needed to get vaccine into these facilities as fast as possible. Um, I can tell you they are jumping for joy um, to be able to get vaccine in these facilities and, and protect lives. Mm -hmm. okay, any more questions? And I, I know you're going to the schools too, right, Julia, you said? Yes, yes. Um, LCO, uh, LCO, LCO Health Care Center is managing LCO schools and college. And um, it's, it's just a huge boon for us to be able to partner um, with them, and then we'll be managing Winter um, and Hayward. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay, thank you, Julia. Really thank you, everybody. You. Thanks, yeah, Julia. Have a good yeah. Okay, first the traffic performance report. I haven't uh, reviewed it. Patty uh, was on. I am on. Oh, oh great. I didn't know that. Hmm. <laughs> what is there was a glitch in my computer there for a moment. Everybody froze, but I'm back. <laughs> uh, we are working on ending off 2020. Our final bills are paid at the end of January. So the report that you're looking at goes through November. And um, there are three months lag on anything that is coming in from the state. So our December, of course, is a very hefty month in paying bills. There'll be three months worth of state mental hospital bills still coming in. But we are also getting in um, revenue from prior periods. We just recently got, uh, in December, we got the final 2019 ADRC payment and we got um, our Medicaid cost report um, payment for CCS. So that helps off a little bit. At this point in time, we really can't see where we are at um, for the year yet and how it's coming out, but I, Mike Keefe and I have spoken several times and we're keeping our finger on the pulse of it and communicating as soon as we do get revenue or um, any significant additional expenses and reviewing it together. Okay, comments? Questions? Um, yeah. Do we uh, do we expect any more COVID money possibly in 21, Patty? I know we had received 
And Tom and you and Mike did a great job in getting even more than we'd expected in COVID dollars. Um, do you think we can budget some COVID money for 21 or what have you heard? Is Julia still on? No. On the call with Julia today, there is money uh, in 21 as well, <laughs> mostly for contact tracing. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you, if you can repeat the question, I will come back on. I was just listening and eating. Oh, 2021 Julia. COVID money, Julia. Uh, yes. Um, and my numbers are very gray at the moment. I was on a call today, but I was in my car listening, so I couldn't write it down. But um, we do have um, we do have contact tracing money that we know is being slotted for us for um, October through June. But I was also told today that in addition to that, we will also be getting um, a good source of funding that will go from October through 2022. And the, and the funding, instead of just being specific to contact tracing, will allow us to be able to spend money for vaccine distribution, which is a huge component of what we'll need to be focusing on as the year goes on. So um, we should have, from what I can see between that and volunteers, um, pretty good funding to be able to get us through. And I can bring back specific dollars next time. Any more budget questions? Services recap. Okay. Any other items for discussion only? Uh, I guess I have one. Is, is Julia still on? Julia, are you still on? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we can do that. <laughs> Uh, or maybe I can ask Dr. Dunlop. Yes, I am. Okay, it's not I can hear. So, yes, I can hear you. Are we, are we seeing any difference with the Pfizer vaccine versus the Moderna in injection site reactions or any um, allergic reactions in the shot, any adverse reactions? Overall, between, and, and I'm looking at, when we're looking at it nationally, because there's a lot of vaccine that's being distributed, no. Um, it, it's, a, it's a range of people having soreness in their arms, um, headaches, some people have some fever, um, more muscle aches than anything. Um, what they do have, which is very interesting and gives us a lot of information, is what is called V-Safe. And so after you receive the vaccine, um, you can sign up for this app and um, very recommended to do that. And then it's from CDC and they check on you every day. And you put in all of your symptoms um, and then how they're impacting you. And um, from what we're, we're seeing, most people are sitting are sticking with mild, meaning that you can still, you might not feel good, you feel not so wonderful the next day, but you can still go to work, you can still do your normal activities, and then by the next day you're feeling pretty good. Um, not very many people, from what we're seeing, is following into that area where they need to take a day or two off of work. So that is very rare to have that happen. And locally, we haven't had anybody report that there has been an anaphylactic reaction, which means a very severe, severe allergic reaction where we'd have to give them epinephrine or what you might know as an EpiPen. So um, that has not occurred. But when we give vaccines um, in a wide, wide range of people, um, any vaccine, anything that's being put into your body when you go into the hospital can cause an allergic reaction. And when you're using it on this wider range, we are going to see those eventually. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.